right, Kevin, from one game seven in Boston to the Bay Area where they are hoping they can force a game seven. The Warriors are against the Raptors. Raptors back at practice today, two days after coming within just one point of shutting down the two-time defending champions. The reality is, though, pardon the pun, but the ball is still in the Raptors' court. Warriors are the ones that must win. So Kawhi Leonard and company, they're maintaining perspective. Just for many other games, just uh, look at our mistakes, try not to make them again and um, go out there in the next game and, you know, just play with each other, have uh, one focus and, you know, one goal and, you know, try to try to win it out. Tomorrow will be a tough task. Um, we'll be ready to go. We'll be ready to play basketball. You know, 48 minutes on that hardwood and um, go out there and do our jobs and play extremely hard. Portland on the Road continues now live from the Bay Area. And Michael Wilbon from PTI joins me now live from downtown San Francisco. And Michael, this Raptors team, they know, frankly, that they let one get away. And that can, as we've seen in the past, that can be really difficult to overcome and try to move on from. What is the biggest thing they need to overcome tomorrow night when they hit the court? What's the most important thing? Well, Sage, I don't think they'll have the same set of conditions. And, and the primary condition being they seem to think, at least some members of the team, that they had a little cushion. And they played like they thought they had some cushion, up 3-1. And, you know, as we often know from players who have been through this over the years and former players, they were telling members of the Raptors, you can't do that. You've got to play as if this is your own game seven at home. They didn't do that, at least not until late in the game in the fourth quarter. So they won't have that set of conditions. Now, on the road, up 3-2, I don't think they're going to approach this like they have a cushion because they don't. Even though this is technically not a must-win game for the Raptors in the pursuit of a championship. But I think we'll see a much more urgent uh, sort of attitude and performance out of Toronto earlier in that game instead of sort of waiting until the fourth quarter as they did in game five. A win would be so impressive for obvious reasons, but if they bring down the champs by beating them four times in one season at Oracle, it'll be the first time that's happened. Nobody had done that three times, except the Warriors came in, the Raptors came in and did just that the other night. Okay, we were sitting together in Toronto, Michael, for Game 5 when Kevin Durant went down, and, and I mean, again, this is media. Nobody's biased, and it, there was a collective sigh. As far as his future is concerned, we hope for his recovery quickly. But as far as that future is concerned, Michael, how do you think now this injury will impact the decision Kevin has to make about his future? Well, of course, Sage, and, and it was really it was a collective groan, I, I think, um, yeah. to be fair, that we all sort of let out when we saw that happening. And, and nobody's talked to, to Kevin Durant yet. But I have talked to people who have been free agents. Um, a lot of current and former players. And, and what I find interesting, and I, I pose one question to them, Sage. If you suffered this injury, could you see yourself going to a new team, not just a new team and new teammates, but a new medical staff? How would that work? And, and, and unanimously, I've gotten people shaking their heads saying they don't think they would approach it that way. Um, if they had a chance to stay with a familiar medical staff. And by the way, remember, it's only year one of this particular group, this particular staff at Golden State. Okay. But still, um, they think it's difficult to go somewhere else and rehab and miss a year. It's not about the money. It's not about the opportunity. It's not about whether people want Kevin Durant. They still do. The question is now, and we'll find out eventually, how Kevin Durant feels about rehabbing from such a, a serious injury, one that – Hardly anybody has come back full strength, 100% from since they've had it. Other, other things, broken legs, you know, torn ACLs, people have come back just as good as new or close to it. Not so with, with torn Achilles. So we, we've got a lot to find out and to see how Kevin Durant yeah. feels about the possibility of switching teams and not having familiar surroundings and people around him working with him every day. Now, along with the staff, it's also the fact that, hey, I stay here and I can probably continue to win championships right here with the staff and the players that he knows. Michael Wilbon, we appreciate your perspective. As always, see you tomorrow night for Game 6 down on the court, Sports Center at Oracle. So after the Raptors took Game 1 at home, the road teams won Games 2 through 5. Think about this, guys, because this series marks just the third time in finals history that the road teams have won four straight games. It happened in 1974 and 1990, but that's it. However, However, there has never been an NBA Finals where the road teams won five consecutive games, so history could happen again tomorrow night. In the playoffs, you have some exhilarating wins and you have some deflating losses. And so you have to be able to uh, deal with both and stay as emotionally even keel as possible.
They have a team that is healthier. They are have home court advantage still. They got two shots at it. And if you're Nick Nurse, all you're trying to do to me is get your team to lock in on what's next. And they've played exceptionally well here in games three and four. And I would expect them to play an, ex, uh, an outstanding game tomorrow night. Yeah, basically do what they've been doing for the majority of this series and this season, for that matter. Game six, they know they're going to be facing it because those fans will be on fire for officially the last game in the 47-year history of Oracle Arena. Jeff Van Gundy, front and center for game six. Look forward to the call tomorrow night, Jeff. Thank you for joining us. You got it. Sports Center on the road is presented by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loan. 23 teams continue mandatory minicamp this week around the NFL, including the Vikings, who felt short of uh, some high expectations a year ago when they brought in Kirk Cousins. Cousins completed over 70% of his passes, threw for over 4,000 yards and 30 touchdowns, but the Vikings failed to beat the Bears in Week 17 to clinch a playoff spot, and Cousins, he reflected. I think the next level really is all about winning. You know, I'm, I'm pretty much a 500 quarterback in my career so far, and I don't think... Uh, that's where you want to be, and that's not you know, why you are brought in or, or people are excited about you. So if I don't play well, if I don't have gaudy statistics, but we win multiple playoff games this year, the narrative will be I went to the next level. And I may not walk off the field every day feeling like I did, but if we win, that's the life of a quarterback is, is you are at the next level. And if I have my best year yet in 2019, but we're 8-8, eight and eight, I didn't go to the next level. So that, that's the reality of it. Since becoming a full-time starter, Cousins is 32-30-2. Great to have the better-looking and better-dressed Hasselbeck. That is Matt joining us here on SportsCenter. So Cousins says he's been an average NFL quarterback of late. What do you make of that evaluation? Well, I like the mentality that he's taking, and I'll say this. To win this division, you have to be an above-average quarterback. Think about it. You got the Green Bay Packers and Aaron Rodgers. You got Mitchell Trubisky playing great football, Pro Bowl level on a great team. And then a wild card with Detroit. You know, Matthew Stafford, Detroit. Lions. They're a dangerous team, probably not the favorite, but I absolutely agree with Kirk Cousins, and it'll be fun to watch. They've got some new weapons there in Minnesota, and I'm talking about two tight ends that can make plays. they got to establish the run, too, to help Cousins. We didn't see well, a lot of that You know Mike Zimmer's going to make him do that. Exactly. Now, one of the big topics this week has been how Carson Wentz's deal, that new extension last week, will affect Dak Prescott and Jared Goff when it comes to negotiations. You have no information about the money. I want to know about the talent as we take a look at this 2016 I, draft I do class. have some information about the money. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. So, yes. listen, what have they done in their first first four years, how I'm going to rank them, it's tough because they've all been very successful. But third, I'm going to go with Dak Prescott. Doesn't mean that he's not a great quarterback. He is. But Dak Prescott, I'm going to put him third because, basically because these other two guys are so good. Yeah. And so I got to do this to you. <laughs> I'm not offended. Listen, he would have been MVP two years ago had yes, he, he stayed healthy, but he didn't stay healthy. And so his backup went on to be Super Bowl MVP. Okay. But I mentioned he wasn't available, and the greatest ab ability is availability. And I'm putting Jared Goff number one, and partially because I'm kind of sick and tired of people not giving Jared Goff his due. He is a very good deep ball, pa deep ball passer. And we talk about why was he the first round, pick, first overall pick? Second level throws. Some guys are great at throwing the ball, you know, accurately and seeing vision under 20 yards. This guy's elite, like really, really good. One of the best in the game at throwing the ball deep, and he doesn't get the credit. And one of the reasons why, he's a great at anticipating. Watch this play here. The ball is halfway there before the wide receiver even turns around. When the receiver turns around, the ball should be halfway there. That's textbook. He could get it out in front a little bit more. But I really think that Jared Goff, maybe it's because Sean McVay, mm -hmm. or maybe it's because of all the stars on defense, or Todd Gurley, he doesn't get the, the recognition that he, that he deserves. All right, well, what you're seeing right now is number one in that draft class, number two in that draft class. And, and 135. Then, and 135. Guess He's going to make more than 30 million a year, more than 30 million a year, more than 30 million. Life is good. I guess you so. You gained two, 10 years too early, Matt Hasselbeck. Yeah. All right, let's take a look at the, the winning here, though. Here's where Dak Prescott separates himself. 32 wins as a starting quarterback since entering the league in 2016. Second most in the league, trailing only Tom Brady. Three of the four quarterbacks who've won at least 30 games in that same time frame have taken home more than $40 million in cash. Prescott, however, has earned just $2 million in his first three NFL seasons. 
Other NFL news today, less than a week after the Texans shocked many by firing GM Brian Gain, Adam Schefter tweeting out this, the Patriots filed tampering charges Wednesday against the Texans for the attempted GM hire of Nick Casario. According to league sources, the NFL now is expected to gather relevant information to open its investigation against Houston per source. Welcome back to Sports Center. Kevin Agandhi, Sage Steele, live from Oakland, California, where this is the big story as Kevin Durant announces on his Instagram account today that he indeed ruptures, rupture his Achilles tendon, and he had surgery today to repair it as well. Here is Clay Thompson. Uh, I'll continue here. Prior to Monday, he had missed the last nine games with a calf injury but this is the moment he went down in the second quarter and you could tell immediately by the look on his face he knew it was not good again surgery today ruptured right achilles tendon here's clay and step on how he expects the fans to try and help and i expect our fans to be the loudest they've ever been especially in the name of kevin and you know bringing his type of spirit he would bring to the fight and, and the competitiveness i know our fans will do that because we deserve it, but more importantly, Kevin does for what he gave this team, this organization. There wouldn't be banners if it wasn't for his presence, so we uh, expect our crowd to be loud for him. I don't think much needs to be said about the motivation that we have or are going to have tomorrow, like Clay said, to protect our home court, feed off our crowd's energy, play for K, and try to keep our season alive. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can uh, kind of tap into for for energy tomorrow um they'll be ready you know they'll be ready as for the odds they're two and a half point favorites now and their final game at oracle arena they've done so many great things there over the last five years in particular but this is it no matter what this is it tomorrow night caesars has set the over under at 211 points in the previous five games in the series the teams have combined to score an average of 216 tip off nine o'clock eastern time tomorrow night on abc kevin